Well, let's see. It really had to do with uh, why, I guess that was the question I was trying to deal with, why we did this. And then that branched out in all directions about family and religious life and understanding and community. And um, just a whole view of people and life and death today, you know. And then certainly the question of who is responsible for what's going on. Are we allowed to dump that and say that it's in the hands of GE or the hands of the State Department or the hands of the Pentagon? And then... Um, can you live a human life if you've if you've uh, abdicated that kind of um, you know, what does a concern and compassion and sense of others that is that is simply being wiped out by this nuclear arms race? So um, I I just wish for you know for the sake of the jury and the sake of everybody that all eight of us have been able to speak, but we weren't obviously weren't allowed to. At least we couldn't do. The way we wanted, and so we stopped the process. But I think that was mainly it. We were trying to say that <clears throat> the very nature of this weaponry is so atrocious that it has to be kept secret, and that in the courtroom, when it was obvious that those responsible for this stuff were brought in there um, to say what we had done, they wouldn't say what they had done. They uh, shied away from any kind of connection, moral connection, responsibility, sense of what this stuff was. They wouldn't even name it. That whole atrocious effort to render this stuff neutral or harmless, um, to get it sort of tied into people's lives as something normal, um, and then walk away. You know, walk away and say, uh, you know, there's another ape behind me on my back, and he's got another one behind him on his back, and uh, the buck stops nowhere with these people. The thing that struck me about, mostly about what she said is when you said, we or I cannot not do this. Right. Well, that was the way I was trying to put it when I reflected on it a uh, day or so ahead of time and knew I might be on the stand there. It did come down to that. I could not not do this, that everything in my life, everything in my testament and my understanding of uh, Christianity doesn't let me walk away. doesn't let me walk away, even though I might want to. It might be a little bit easier to. But um, it was a way, really, of expressing the enormous pressure of spiritual understanding that just doesn't let, let people alone unless, unless they choose to get rid of it, which, of course, we know you can. We know it by those employees. I really, uh, you know, when those people were talking, those uh, tool makers and the financial wizard and uh, even the upper echelon guards, I got this whiff of brimstone out of those people. It was just, uh, for me, it was the stink of Germany. And uh, we certainly have evidence that a lot of Germans knew what was going on. And uh, they blocked it out exactly the way these people are, you know. Same thing. Except that it's worse. Here it's even worse. So you feel like uh, you see yourself as a spokesman of conscience? Well, I don't know about being a spokesman. I, this really isn't my bag. Uh, I, I would like to be a human being in a lousy time, and uh, when, I, when I'm when pushed to have to talk about it, I'll do it, you know. I think it's much more important to do it than to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So, in a certain sense, my, what you were expressing in the courtroom yesterday also sounded to me as if you were doing something that you didn't particularly want to do, but you had to do. Yeah, that's probably it. I don't think any sane person wants to go through this meat grinder called a court, and uh, certainly no one I've ever met wants to go to jail, and I, I'm not particularly fond of public notoriety. i rather do my work in my corner, but uh, that's all beside the point, really, when these, these things are going on, I think. Talk to some of the people about the actual action that took place. Mm -hmm. It seemed to have a kind of symbolic 
almost ritual quality to it. That's I think has been grabbed here and there, and and certainly that's the way it was intended. You know, it could be taken from many many points of view. But those symbols of blood and hammers were very deliberately chosen, and uh, they're primordial uh, symbols of life, symbols of building, symbols of building the earth, uh, symbols of pro-human property. The hammers certainly. But a hammer is also a prophetic tool of pulling things down. Don't belong there, you know. And that's right out of Isaiah too. That things that shouldn't be around ought to be pulled down. And before really you can build a human earth, you have to pull down what's inhuman. So that was all part of it. And then of course the blood is just about as old as the earth, as old as a human being um, on the earth. And um, I guess almost from the beginning, people have shed the blood of others. We have the very ancient story of Cain and Abel. But then we have the story of Jesus, too, and we have a very clear choice in another direction, the giving of blood rather than the shedding of blood. And uh, as Sister Anne Montgomery pointed out on the stand, you know, the whole thing was just carefully, carefully thought through in the sense that we didn't go in there on a rampage. We went in there hoping, symbolically, to touch two or three of those uh, instruments of genocide and to throw blood around. And even if we hadn't reached the warheads, we would have thrown the blood around. We, we were going to say, if we couldn't get beyond the lobby, we would stand there in a circle and pray and throw our blood around and lay the hammers down on the floor. But it was such an extraordinary providence that we got to those warheads. Uh, we never expected to. Um, Mr. Strickland, last night, referred to the action that was taken by you and the others as being in the best prophetic tradition, uh -huh. in the sense that um, symbolically what you did was to call to the attention of the people what was going on and at the same time challenge the state. Yeah, right. I think that puts it well. And I would trust his interpretation as an old friend and a real Christian. Okay, so do you feel what you were primarily motivated by was political or religious or whether there is any real separation? It's very hard for me to separate those two words out. You know, I think they're really hyphenated realities and that, that any religion worth talking about is essentially political. And any politics worth talking about has some vision of transcendence and of the mystery of human life. And uh, so the two, in my mind, have always melded. Yeah. So uh, my sense of this trial is that there seems to be some kind of continuity in terms of the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. Christ himself suffered and sacrificed and was brought to trial. Yeah, right. And if there's some kind of continuation of that. Well, we hope so. I mean, I, I think it's not, it's, there may be two questions here. The, the first would be the way we see things in our hearts, the defendants, or the way we pray, you know, and commune with God. We certainly draw upon the example of Jesus all the time. But I don't want to get big in, about it in public because I think that's a very private thing in a way, you know. And, and a lot of lousy religion keeps claiming Jesus for its mentor or God. And I think real religion gets a little bit modest in public, you know. But it certainly is very important to us that Jesus gave his life. You, um, excuse me if I'm on my domain, but no, in some okay. sense of, uh, you have a reluctance in terms of both publicity and uh, perhaps the media and work and, and being a leader. I'm wondering why you have that reluctance to be a leader. Well, I don't like the word leader, first of all. I just think that you do what is right and because it's right. And that, you know, in any sane situation, let's say a, a really healthy society, everybody would do these things in such a time. Everybody would be yelling out and crying out and finding ways of saying this cannot go on. Um, I think it's a very uh, 
know what to say, a kind of a dying culture that throws up leaders. It's a very dangerous thing, you know, because you end up with leaders like Reagan, or you end up with leaders like uh, Hitler. But the hierarchy of the church. Well, they haven't given much moral leadership. I mean, I just think that's not very helpful either. <laughs> few of them showed up at the trial, but that was very few. <laughs> so how do we ins inspire people to take on responsibility for their own lives? Well, I mean, a part of our hope certainly was that this action would help awaken the questions that are questions for every living being, you know, and that nobody can come to the age of reason in such a world as ours and not have these questions on his or her mind. Um, but it, the fact is that a lot of people don't, millions of people don't, so we thought, well, maybe this will help, you know, and I think it has. I think a lot of people have said that probably was important. You must have some strong feelings then about being inhibited by the judge in presenting the Nuremberg defense and doctrinal justification. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole thing was absolutely atrocious, and we put up with it for, what is it now, ten days, well, we really nine days, um, being harassed, being put down, being despised being shown the utmost prejudice, even from a legal point of view. It started the first day, and it went on, it went on, it went on, and then we had to say we're not going with it, and that's why we're in contempt now. Why do you think the judge behaved the way he did, not, not from a legal point of view? Well, I think he's no different than the other judges in this Montgomery County. See, we have a long history in this county now of... of, of meeting the legal situation. It's about seven months of very intense meetings with various judges and public defenders and lawyers. And, and then four of us being over there in the prison for five months, um, you have a tremendous uh, inner view of the workings of this whole thing. He's not atypical at all. He's quite typical. Though he's perhaps worse than the others, he's typical of the others. And their history is as we've learned over these months, their history is of uh, the most atrocious contempt for their own law. And the, uh, you know, the locking up of people whose crime is their color and their poverty. And so he's used to that, and he doesn't know any other way of conducting himself. And, of course, we were, we were continually irritating to him because we would just continue to object to what he was doing. Um, and I think that got him more and more riled, you know, more and more sort of, uh, I don't know what, out of his head, and um, unable to cope. But we were always connecting our treatment in the courtroom as vividly as we could with the treatment of hundreds and hundreds of prisoners, several hundred of whom are over there in jail now because of him and judges here like him. And they're there without bail. They're there for very long terms, for minor infractions. They're there because of multiplied charges. They're there because the public defenders are in collusion with the prosecutors. They're all under one roof, and they all play the same game. And, um, well, that's about it. He, he came down on us the way he's come down on everybody, except that he didn't... Uh, have it that easy, and the last chapter is not written. Well, I I don't know, except that you know we're capable. The eight of us, I think, are capable of creating. I don't know, sort of scenarios of resistance, as we did um, today, both at General Electric and in the courtroom, and. Um, I mean, you know, we're not disposed of, I guess I'm trying to say, we're not disposed of by being found guilty or by being locked up. That's just the beginning of another chapter. So you see that as a, in a certain sense, a continuation of the enactment that originally took place in general. Absolutely, and, and part of our 
struggle had nothing to do with the judge, except as he kept invading us, the real struggle is to keep a coherent uh, spiritual continuity between September 9th at GE and six months later in that courtroom so that people can understand that and we can understand within ourselves that that our lives are not blown apart our lives are of a peace our conscience is intact things like that so you don't have any fear of jail? well I've been through all this so often I, you know, I don't like jail <laughs> um, and I know this is going to be a long one but I think it's the right thing I guess that's the best thing to say even though you know you don't like it, it's still the right thing. Mm, of course. There's some kind of message in that that you can expand on the rest of it. And perhaps aren't quite as courageous. Well, we saw a movie over here called Nixon's Secret Legacy yesterday. I don't know. Have you seen it at all? It wasn't anything terribly new to me about the way in which Nixon really got counterforce and first strike weaponry going as a policy. Um, but it did shed some light on why we're in, we were in court these past two weeks. Um, and I was thinking especially of that terrific scene where the two young officers, the um, missile operators, were in the bunker way down there behind those dungeon doors. They say they're 12 feet thick. And uh, that's where they live. That's where they work, as they say, you know. And uh, the movie showed them each loading a revolver before they went down. And then they were questioned as to why they were both armed in that way. And they were alone before that awesome machinery. And uh, very reluctantly, uh, it came out that they were supposed, one was supposed to shoot the other if he went insane. Um, I don't know, for me, a scene like that is um, a lesson. Um, it, it, it's a very sharp reminder of the way in which touching any of that nuclear stuff just uh, condemns you to either to be killed or to die even before an explosion and uh, I just thought for me it kind of sharpened the issue about going another way I, you know, I just don't want to have any part in living that way <laughs> or being connected with it even by silence what about the statement that some people make that uh, it's difficult to continue to communicate or to do any good if you're uh, well, that, that's not a very good historical view of it. We, we know that throughout history, any really significant social change has come about through jail experience and through real nonviolent resistance. You know, there's nothing else worth talking about. And all this talk about, you know, send letters to your congressman, all that, that's all dead as a dodo. It's been dead all the while. Even restricting all this to the history of our own country we could point to everything from you know, what to say, abolition to labor rights to women's rights to uh, mitigation of wars, especially Vietnam. And none of it happened without people being in jail. None of it happened. We would still be a colony unless there had been this kind of stuff. We would still be a slave society. We'd still be legally and officially, tightly sexist. Not that we're not, but it would be worse. Unless people had said, you know, lock me up. This is where I stand. And really, it seems to me the nuclear question has sharpened it all to the point where unless there is an awakening, you know, it's all going to come down. <laughs> well, what about the, the ability of people to change from within in terms of their own personal experience? Uh, rather than the necessity of changing external structures. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, it seems to me that, uh, you know, from our point of view, let's say that Plowshares 8, there, there never, never could have been these events in our lives without a spiritual discipline. You know, and that's been going on for many, many years with all of us. Um, 
because that would provide the strength. Sure, and you know that continuity we spoke of earlier, and really a kind of a sane view of people, and and also I think the ability to seize on an occasion like this trial and make the most of it, you know, because we came up to this trial very much alone. We had to rely on ourselves. And even our best friends were not always in agreement with our methods right up to this week, right up to today. <laughs> and uh, this is not to say that we're right. It's just to say that we have to be ourselves. And in order to do that, you really have to come from somewhere. It seems to me that you take an incredibly creative action within the restrictions of this court. Yeah. And that, that seems quite mind-blowing to everyone concerned, both the people who support you, I think, and the, and the people over there. It, it, where does that creativity come from? I think it comes from prayer and from reflection, from reading. It comes from long, long hours of discussion with one another. It really comes from every kind of spiritual weight that you can bring to bear on a bad time, you know? And, uh, I don't know, there's just something that clicks, I think, in a group like that, uh, where it's, we all knew, let's say yesterday afternoon, that the time had come to say, no more. Judge, it's finished. And you have to be able to decide those things under considerable tension, and uh, people are not very well rested, and we've had uh, quite a while of this, and uh, you have to keep your cool <laughs> and listen to another and if there's one seriously dissenting voice over a, let's say a period of a couple of hours the whole group would go with the one dissenter you see what I mean in other words unless we had a very deep consensus we would never have done any of these things so um, and that's been true from the beginning you know? and I think again this comes out of deep waters Well, it's not a question of how to. You see, that's sort of a question of technique. It's it's really a question of, I, I prefer to say it's a question of coming from somewhere, having some tradition available to you, some symbols, some worship, some common life, some experience of common life as we've had for years. Um, come, coming from somewhere better than America, because I don't think... America is anywhere to come from. <laughs> we had heard this morning, in fact, that you have a very courageous mother. Oh, yes. Could you talk about her and how she affected your kind of attitude? Well, it's very, very hard to describe someone that was as close to us as my mother. She only died three years ago at 91. And um, it was like the old age of of Sarah, remember in the book of Genesis, Abraham's wife, where, uh, I mean, old age was no relief, you know what I mean? But there was evidently an unfolding of a youthfulness that went right up to death, really. And, uh, and that was bec because there were continual challenges on the part of, of, of those she loved to stay with us. in ways that kept her thinking about change and all these questions of war and racism, all the things that we were trying for, she was part of, you know? And uh, so she died, but she hadn't grown old. That was the way I would put it. It was kind of a Buddhist ending in that way, or mystical ending. Well, a lot of things went into it. She was an immigrant as a child from Germany, and uh, our family was always poor, working family, and uh, she led a very, very difficult life. Um, and then there was this question of never, never looking upon property as anything very important which I think is a terrible American idolatry, this property over people. I think we just grew up in an atmosphere in which everything belonged to anyone who came to the door. And uh, that was literally true because a lot of people 
did come to the door all the time and were fed and put up and all this. And luckily we had a small farm, so we always had food, right, during the Depression. But it was that stuff, I think, that got into our pores so that we got the idea that in spite of a lot of stuff around us, we didn't have to really, you know, climb over bodies to get somewhere. And um, didn't have to make it in the American sense, things like that. I think she was very good at that example, you know. She didn't do a lot of talking, she just lived that way and she was very cool about it. But it was a good start, you know, and I'm very grateful for it. And um, she went all through our, perhaps our most serious trial up to now, which was Catonsville. And uh, she was very, very ill. I, I was four months underground and couldn't go near her. We really thought she was dying. And then she came back, and when we were locked up, she came in a wheelchair and saw us in jail and brought flowers in. And, um, the word was always very simple, and she didn't even have to say it. It was, you know, you follow your conscience. That's where it leads is something else, but you go there. So that wasn't bad. What about the fact that this is all taking place during near Valley Forge? Is this some kind of symbol for the revolution? And the American revolution? Yeah, yeah, well, I really am not very big on these American battles and things like that. I, I suppose maybe there's some genuine connection here. I haven't even thought about it. I We really don't have many secular connections with our history, you know. I, I think our admir our admiration for our history is is all with the underground and the underdog and those that have really made made something great here, you know, which has been the slaves and the abolitionists and the immigrants and the uh, pioneer women and um, all the people that were writing the secret history that had nothing to do with tycoons and judges and, you know, all this bullshit that's claiming history and is really, you know, going to bring it all down if they have their way. They don't even want to save themselves now. That's how crazy they are. But I mean, we, I think we have a, a vivid sense of what I would call the true history of our country, which is very close to biblical history, you know? It's a very old idea in the Bible that the... Uh, the remnant and the slave and the outcast carry the real burden. Can carry it along, you know? Carry it on. And that's the way God writes history. That's the way uh, Jesus talked about it. He certainly never connected his own conscience when he talked about his history. Jesus never talked about kings, books of kings, all that stuff, battles, winning. He talked about Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, the remnant and the exiles and uh, those that were stuck in Babylon and those that were slaves in Egypt. And that's the way he looked on the world. And that's the way he carried on, I think. So you're talking about a much more transcendent perspective. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's interesting that it's transcendent because it's also very hidden and very under. You know what I mean? Socially speaking. I mean, he would connect not with Pharaoh, but with the slaves of Pharaoh, things like that. And who would he connect with now? Well, it seems to me that for us it's not a, a question really of who he would connect with, it's a question of who he does connect with, you know? And because it's not a question of if he were around, it's a question of he's around. <laughs> he's around. Okay. I don't know what to do. I'm going to go see a question. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if America had been a good thing. Well, we're going to have a good thing. We're going to have a good thing. You know, they say that probably a better sign. I remember Keaton's when they were back in a couple of hours or so. I was for the longest time. But he wanted, um, he kept sending them back, you know, he just wouldn't dismiss these exhausted people. And uh, we found later when we polled the jury that they were 10 to 2 for acquittal. 
<laughs> on all counts. But it was a hung jury and they never tried them again anyway. Mm. Well, we're hoping that there may be a courageous two here. Well, even one, yeah. you know, even one, yeah. But it was, oh, the pressures are so great. Mm -hmm. I just don't know the way he babbled at them as they left, you know. It would take a lot of courage. We'll see. We'll see. Not in their hands anyway. <laughs> okay. Right. Listen, have you seen everything you want to see? No. What else is up? Uh, Ian and Molly. Ian and Molly. Have you talked to Philip at all? But Dean and Molly, well, I don't know. Well, Molly's supposed to be on their way over. Oh, we see. Right oh, right. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The trial, we were able to cover the trial.